Hi guys. So many people have asked me to talk about folic acid being added to our food ingredients so that we can't avoid taking it in. So let's discuss it. Before we get into the whys and wherefores, what is actually happening? Well, folic acid fortification of food will start happening from now and the new regulations will be in full effect across the UK from December 2026. This new directive in law will mean that all non-whole meal wheat flour milled in or imported into the UK will have folic acid added at a rate of 0.25 milligrams per 100 grams of flour. Other existing fortifications like calcium iron, niacin, thiamine are also having their minimum levels increase slightly. This type of flour is widely used in common food products like bread, biscuits, cakes, and ready meals so it will be very hard to avoid and if you eat a lot of these foods or you do a lot of baking cooking with these flours it will be hard to avoid and easy to overdose there are however ways that you can avoid it so buy wholemeal flour gluten-free products or buy flour from very small scale mills so if you have a mill that's producing less than 500 metric tons annually they're exempt from the mandatory fortification so why might you want to avoid it? Well, you've probably heard the official line. It prevents neural tube defects, it's totally safe and there's no downside. But that's the pro-fortification narrative. Today I'm going to give you the other side of the argument. The side that rarely gets airtime, the side that questions whether mass medication, because that's what it is, through food is really the best we can do. And let's be clear, I'm not arguing against folate. I'm not arguing against supplementation in pregnancy. Those are well established. I'm arguing against making every man, woman and child consume synthetic folic acid, whether they need it or not. Fortification is apparently safe for everyone. I would argue that this is ridiculous. No nutrient is universally safe at population scale for every single person. Remember, every time you think about adding a supplement to your diet, it has a warning that you must speak to your medical provider if you have health conditions or you're taking medications. So why is this suddenly different? Well, let's pick it all apart, shall we, and decide. The pro-fortification argument insists that folic acid is harmless for all, but that ignores a key reality. Synthetic folic acid is not the same as natural folate. It has to be converted in the liver and that process saturates very quickly. And when that happens, you get unmetabolized folic acid circulating in your bloodstream. Do we know exactly what that does to us long term? No. Do we see associations between unmetabolized folic acid and immune changes, altered folate reception function and potential tumor growth in people with pre-existing lesions? Yes, we do. And these signals are enough to warrant caution. Good public health isn't about pretending risk doesn't exist. It's about acknowledging uncertainty. Two, it's worth it because it prevents neural tube defects. Neural tube defects are tragic. Folate does indeed reduce that risk. But folate matters, but blanket dose in the entire population is lazy public health. Men don't get pregnant. Children don't get pregnant. Controversial, I know. But if this is the argument, what on earth are we doing? So in relation to neural tube defects, let's deal with the facts. Only women trying to conceive or in early pregnancy benefit from extra folate. That is a tiny percentage of an entire population. Yet the policy forces everyone from two years old to 90 years old to ingest synthetic folic acid daily without consent. That is the equivalent of saying, a small group needs iron supplementation, so let's give iron to the entire population to make it easier. We would never accept that logic. Imagine giving every man, woman and child statins because some people have high cholesterol. But with folic acid, apparently that's fine. So why not do what works? Better education, proper access to women's health services, targeted supplementation, not compulsory fortification of bread. Three, there's no real risk of masking B12 deficiency. This is the oldest and most clinically recognised risk and it affects the elderly the most. One of the strongest medical arguments against high folic acid exposure is the risk of masking a B12 deficiency and here's why it matters. B12 deficiency can cause irreversible neurological damage. Folic acid can correct anemia without fixing the neurological problems. The people most vulnerable are older adults, the largest consumers of bread are older. This isn't theoretical, it's documented and has been for decades. B12 deficiency is underdiagnosed. Mass fortification makes that worse, not better.
The dose in fortified food is tiny, so you won't get too much. Well, intake will vary dramatically by diet, age and socioeconomic status. The assumption that everyone consumes the same, same amount of product is wrong. Heavy consumers of bread, pasta and cereal, which often means children, low-income families and older adults, can easily exceed the safe upper limit through volume. Meanwhile, people who have got low-carb diets or avoid grains get almost none. Fortification is not precise intervention, it is scattergun medicine disguised as policy. Five, it's just like fluoridated water, a success. Firstly, I am not convinced of the fluoridated water safety argument, so no because folic acid has metabolic effects. Folic acid is different. It enters metabolic pathways, influences DNA synthesis, methylation, B12 physiology. It is not inert, it is not passive. It is not a background mineral being topped up. Mandatory folic acid fortification is the first time a synthetic vitamin with systemic metabolic effects has been forced on an entire population. Six, there's no evidence of cancer. That's not what the research says. Let's be precise. There is no proven population-wide increase in cancer, true. But there is consistent evidence that in people with established precancerous bowel lesions, high folic acid may accelerate growth. That is a very different conversation. The ethical question is this. Is it acceptable to increase lifelong folic acid exposure for millions to help a very small group if that exposure may promote existing cancer disease in others? Public health authorities rarely acknowledge this trade-off. You can't call a policy unequivocally safe when signals like this exist in literature. Seven, the benefits outweigh the risks. They might if the intervention were targeted, but it isn't. This argument only works if you believe everyone benefits, no one is harmed, and there is no better way to reach the people who do need folate. None of those statements are true. If we want to reduce neural tube defects further, the solutions are clear. Better access to preconception care, earlier pregnancy recognition, supporting women who struggle to plan pregnancies, and making high quality prenatal supplements affordable, addressing B12, and educating GPs and midwives. Mass fortification is none of those. It's an easy solution, but it's not the best solution. People don't reliably take supplements, so fortification is better. You don't fix a system failure by dosing the entire population without choice. If women don't know to take folate or can't access supplements or struggle with healthcare engagement, that is a system problem. The answer is not medicate everyone, including men and children. Imagine applying that logic elsewhere. If people don't exercise, we'll medicate them all with statins. We'd laugh at that idea. But with folic acid, different logic applies apparently. Compliance problems deserve better public health, not blanket exposure. Nine, it's cost effective. I don't care. Cost effective does not equal ethical, safe or justified. Mass fortification might be cheap, of course it is. You add a synthetic vitamin to flour and you call it a win. But cost effectiveness should not steamroll biological complexity, individual autonomy, long-term uncertainty, unintended metabolic consequences. Cheap interventions are not good. 10. Nobody is harmed, so what's the issue? Well, just as with COVID vaccinations, they cannot say nobody will be harmed for all of the reasons that I've already given you. So thereafter, autonomy matters, consent matters, choice matters. Even if folic acid fortification carries zero biological risk, which it doesn't, there is a bigger principle at stake. Should the state have the power to medicate the entire population without consent for the benefit of a small subgroup? This is a philosophical and ethical question, not just a medical one. If you accept folic acid fortification, you are accepting the principle that the state can modify your biochemistry without your permission. Where is the line? Who decides? On what basis? Good public health earns consent. It does not bypass it. So, 
In summary, yes, folate reduces neural tube defects, but that doesn't automatically justify mandatory fortification. We must be willing to say the uncomfortable thing whenever policy becomes oversimplified. Targeted interventions are ethical, effective and safe. Population-wide compulsory dosing is blunt, imprecise and carries unresolved questions. Support women with proper care, educate, prioritise autonomy and stop pretending mandatory folic acid is the only or best option. If we can't question public health policy, we don't have science, we have dogma. So suffice it to say, guys, it's a no from me for fortification of our food with folate and I will be buying my way around it. Take care. See you soon.